So if you're expecting to hear about Arches version seven, you're in the right space. Uh, and once again, thanks for joining. Uh, before we jump into the details, just a couple small housekeeping details here. Um, please keep yourself on mute for the conversation, but I do encourage you to ask questions as we go. So I think the way this could work is if you have a question, please use the Zoom tools to raise your hand or type your question into the into the chat box. And Cyrus and I will make a point of stopping along the way to see if there are any questions. And if there are, we'll ask you to just pose your question if you raised your hand or if you've chosen to use the chat box, we will uh, we'll read your question and try to take our best swing at answering. Um, so that I think is how we'd like this to go. Um, I also know that we've got about an hour and there's a lot to talk about. So a, I will just say that we're gonna try to cover the, the full set of topics. And if it turns out that we need more detail we can talk about a organizing or scheduling a second call uh, to go over the version seven items in much more detail. Our topics today will really fall into these categories. Uh, I'll start with a quick description of where we are on the roadmap, and then we'll have a chat about a number of items that are very specific to Arches version seven. So let's dive in. We, um, we, we have a roadmap for Arches, and if you'd like to see it and, and track how it changes through time, you can go to the archesproject.org website. There's a page specifically for the roadmap. Uh, what I'd like to do, actually, is point out two things. The first is there are really two versions of Arches, Arches version 6, and in fact, version 6.1, which was just released uh, relatively recently, just in the last couple of weeks. And it provides a number of updates and bug fixes and enhancements. And uh, it's worth knowing that we'll continue to support version six with bug fixes for at least the next year or so. Uh, on the other hand, we're actively working on Arches version seven. And Arches version seven is about to be released. It'll actually be released at the end of this month. And it has quite a number of new features in it. And you might be asking yourself, why have two versions of Arches? And the short answer is not everybody needs to support multiple languages. And that's one of the key things in Arches version seven. So uh, if it turns out that you're happy with version six and you don't need to worry about uh, supporting multiple languages in Arches, you can continue to use six, at least for the next year or so. On the other hand, if one of your key requirements is to support your user community with languages beyond just English, then Arches version seven is definitely the version for you. I'm gonna start with what I think most people see as the biggest aspect of Arches version seven, and that is this idea of internationalization and what we mean by that. So in, I guess, the most succinct way possible, I'll say that for us, Arches version seven includes internationalization. And what that means is Arches is now capable of supporting the display of its interface and the management of its data in multiple languages. So you, you no longer are uh, really constrained to a single language. And in fact, we've done a pretty complete rethink of how Arches supports multiple languages and what the implications are for managing data in multiple languages. And you'll find that there are many, many new tools to support multiple languages in Arches. Um, some key items here is not only the ability to let you, you or your users decide what language to show the interface in, but also for those languages 
that whose scripts are read from right to left, uh, there is now support, there will be support in version seven for that capability. So as an example, I believe Urdu is a language that is read from right to left, as opposed to English, which is read from left to right. And if you were to select Urdu as your language of choice, the user interface would reflect that. And I'll just point out that internationalization includes more than just multiple languages and multiple scripts, but also the ability or the need to manage data, and in particular, your string data um, in multiple languages. And Arches version seven actually supports that. So a single node, a single string node, can support values in multiple languages. Then there's the concept of localization. And localization is really, I guess in a way, a fancy way of talking about the actual translation. Uh, what it means, to me, localization is the act of taking a, uh, a, a text and, trans, and transposing it, trans, translating it into a second text. And this is as much art as it is science. Um, Hopefully this little Twitter conversation gets to the heart of the matter, which is to say, when you build your art, when you build an Arches application uh, and you build it in a language, someone is gonna need to translate that into a second language. And there's some effort and some, and as I suggest some art into that. So in a nutshell, when we talk about multiple language support in Arches, we're talking about internationalization, the ability to support multiple languages and the data that you need to collect in multiple languages. And that's something that we've built into Arches. The actual localization, the, the translation part, is something that really is going to fall to the user community. And, um, and we actually have some tools to help you support that. Uh, we've already set up a site called TransFX that allows community members to take the Arches, the core Arches application and translate all the static strings in Arches into alternate languages. And here's a little screenshot that shows a bit of the status. Uh, the core language for Arches is English, and there are tools in place to support the translation of all the core arches strings, the static strings into multiple languages. And this is just one of many tools that you may use to, to support the translation. Um, and they're helpful. I mean, that is really for sure the place to start. But I wanna point out that, uh, and I've sort of lightly use this terminology of static strings. The string and static strings are the strings that are uh, that are part of the Arch's core user interface. But of course, one of the key, one of really the key aspects of Arch's is it allows you to define your own models and your own data entry forms. And these are not static strings. These are what we call dynamic strings. And these, these cards, your data entry cards, for example, uh, also will need to be translated into uh, the languages you want to support. And since you build your models yourselves, uh, Arches comes with the tools that you'll need, that you'll want to use to support um, creating the labels in your data entry cards in multiple languages. And um, that's a very quick summary of what we mean by internationalization and localization in Arches version seven. And I think is maybe a good place to stop and see if we can, um, if we can answer some questions. And David, I believe you're tracking the questions. Um, maybe you could, maybe you could um, see if, if you could read the first couple questions. I'm watching for questions. I don't see any yet. 
Okay. I think there might be some in chat. No? I've seen, I've seen comments, but no questions yet. Okay, perfect. Well, then, thanks. Thanks for checking. Um, Cyrus, is there anything else around internationalization that we that you want to add before we move on to the next topic? Um, no, I just I'll just point out that yeah. So you have you know <clears throat> your um, localization in in core arches and arches will ship with um, with languages uh, or translations for core. But then you'll have this separate task of of translating your your um, your graphs and your card labels and names, as as you mentioned. So there'll be there's kind of a division there. Um, but yeah, that's I think that was a great thanks. So maybe just to hammer that point home, you're looking at a screenshot here of a model from historic England, and when I say that there is some there's there will be some work for you to translate what i mean specifically is in this example uh it will be up to you to design to decide how to translate designation and protection assignment and designation name and grade for example into the languages beyond english that you wish to support and the reason for that is these are your models and you've you've designed them uh completely independently so although there is some work for you where where you won't have to worry is where it says card designer or where it says card configuration or settings all the things that come as uh, default by arches those strings will already be translated for you dennis in case you didn't see it we did have our first question through chat okay from, from carl vogel asking what languages are supported already are there any uh, thanks for the question, Carl. There are a number of languages that have already gone through community translation for core arches, and I think have achieved a hundred percent review. And off the top of my head, I'll say those languages are French, Urdu, and Bulgarian, and I believe Hebrew are the are the languages that I know for sure have been fully translated. I also know that Arabic is in flight. Um, I believe Russian is in flight or is potentially completed. And I believe Spanish is also in flight. Um, and of course, any other language that you, that, that you as a community member feel like you'd like to support, um, there's, absolutely nothing stopping you from um, tapping the, into the community and asking for help in creating a set of translations for any, kind of really any, any language that you find interesting. Are there any other questions, David? Uh, you're on mute. Just a comment from Crystal saying that Arabic is up to 30% now and getting there. Excellent. Let's move on. And uh, our next topic is user authentication. And really the key thing here is in version seven, we'll be introducing what's known as multi-factor authentication, in our case, two-factor authentication. And it's going to ask Cyrus to give a quick summary of what we mean by this. Yeah, so <clears throat> um, of course, currently in Arches, um, you know, user just authenticates with a password, but in um, version seven, uh, admins will be able to enable um, two-factor authentication. So um, users will then um, be able to uh, use an authenticator app to, um, to generate a token to uh, verify their authentication. And that is implemented, um, or at least an admin has two ways that they can implement that. They can um, require it and force all users to use two-factor authentication, or they can make it an option. So the user has the choice to use two-factor authentication or not. And um, the, the, the mobile applications that people can use or you know, any, any 
you know, popular um, two-factor authentication app like um, uh, the Google Authenticator, and uh, there's an open source one called Authy. So, um, so yeah, um, or uh, an admin can choose uh, not to use two-factor authentication at all. If that's what they want. Great, thanks, Cyrus. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions related to that? There's there's a new question from Mahmoud asking: Is Fido two supported? physical keys i'm um i'm not familiar with uh with with fido um says like like you i'm not sure i'm not familiar with that either i'm i'm sorry uh mahmoud um That could be something we check into. Yeah, yeah, we'll look into that and yeah, get back to you. So. Any other questions, David? Uh, not yet, no. Okay. Let's move on to our next major topic, and that is the import and export of data into Arches. And I'll just say that if you've been in the position of having to import large data sets into arches you know that that's a pretty it's a pretty pretty big lift there's a lot that goes into data import and data export and one of the main things that we're aware of in arches is that there are some there's some there are some restrictions or constraints in how you structure your data for import and we're aware of that and in version seven, we relaxed a lot of those constraints. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. We also know that loading data into Arches can take some time. And the reason for that is because we spend a lot of time doing data validation when we ingest data. And that data validation can be quite expensive. And then once the data are loaded into Arches, then we index the data into Elasticsearch, which also can be quite expensive. So part of what we've done in version seven is to try to simplify the process and to try to speed up the process. And I'll show you a couple ways that that's possible. The first is really this introduction of what we're, what we're calling the ETL manager. So apologies for a really unsexy name. Uh, probably, we probably couldn't come up with anything worse than that. But there you go. It's what that's what we're calling it right now. Uh, definitely welcome to suggestions for improving the terminology here. But what we mean by this is, as you can see, a, a, an interface that lets you import and export data. And the idea here is, it's a way of including a whole um, data processing module into the Arches platform. And it's designed to let a developer uh, create an import, essentially an importer and an exporter. And we have we've built an importer for a single CSV file. So now instead of having to put your data into an Arches structured CSV file, you can take any CSV any CSV file that you'd like uh, and use the importer here to identify the model that you want to import into and then map the columns of your CSV file into the nodes of the target graph. And Arches will do a quick validation and then start the data load. And that data load will be done asynchronously, which means that once you start the load, you can move on to other, other parts of the Arches application. You don't have to wait for it to finish. And Arches will then keep track of the state of your import job, and uh, it will it'll let you know when it's done. I can tell you that our initial testing has shown that this approach is quite a bit faster than our current version six data import tools. Uh, my own testing suggests that um, taking a file that might have 
required an hour's worth of processing using Arch's command line tools can be processed in just a few minutes with this importer. So there's a significant performance improvement here. And it's just a lot easier because there's, there's a user interface. Uh, you don't have to have command line access to Arches to do a data import. I guess the other thing to point out here is this module has specifically been designed to be very flexible and allow a developer to introduce an importer for really any format that you're that that you find interesting or worth working with. So if you're working with structured import structured files from third parties, uh, you could you could write an importer specifically to support a very specific format. And the the reverse is true as well. You can write an exporter to export Arches data into specific formats if you wish to. And maybe that's a good place to stop and see if there are any questions. Can I can I add one more thing, Dennis? Oh, please do. Um, this also gives you the option to undo a load. So let's say you loaded some data and you decided, oh, you know, um, there was something wrong with it. You could actually reverse that load, make your changes, and then rerun the load again. So also a nice feature for those who need that yeah for those who need that. uh david are we good with questions uh no questions but there's lots of nice and um very much agreed this is cool so some feedback excellent well thanks for the feedback i'll just tip our hand a little bit here and say that right now we've got this set up for importing data and exporting data from arches uh i think we were already talking about how to extend this etl manager to include scripts for bulk update bulk updates of data already in arches so imagine the case where you've uploaded say a hundred thousand new instances and you realize that you misspelled um, a common, you know, a, a, a common word. And instead of having to unload and reload, we think we'll be able to provide, say, um, find and replace tools for making that kind of bulk update easier and, and, and plausible. We do have one question now from Marcus, which is when you write an importer, it means you can reuse that mapping over and over in the future. That's a question. Yeah, um, actually, Cyrus was one of the main designers of of uh, this this module. So, you, Cyrus, maybe you can provide a bit more detail there. Yeah, so I mean, if you if you wrote your own custom importer, then yeah, you could you could reuse that mapping over and over. Um, you know, there's there's um, endless possibilities really of what you can you know design you know for your for your importer. Although, um, you know, designing an importer does require, you know, some Python knowledge and JavaScript as well. These are components like other components in Arches. So. One nice thing to point out here also, and that's because it's a really good question, is as the community writes additional importers and exporters, those should be shareable. So mm -hmm. you only have to write that importer once or that exporter once. And then others who might find it useful can take advantage of your good work in the same way that you can take advantage of the work of someone who's put the effort into writing an importer that you find useful. So this is a good place, I think, for the community to see um, value in supporting one another with essentially shared effort. One new comment from Thomas Hewitt. Um that bulk update is the next big issue. Yep. Uh, bulk update is definitely on our radar. Um, we have also introduced another way of working with data in bulk in Arches. And really, they boil down to what I'll just call database database tools. So we've introduced this ability to work with Arches directly at the database level. So if you know SQL and you're comfortable with using SQL 
to manipulate data, we have introduced a series of essentially helper functions that you can access from directly from Arch's transactional database, which happens to be Postgres. And you can use these helper functions to um, create, update, delete, modify, as you see fit, um, data directly inside the database. And just to give you a, like a sense of what's possible here, uh, as you write your models, you can use a helper function to, to represent those models in traditional relational series of relational views here. Um, one thing to remember in Postgres views are updatable. So what we've done here is provide you with what amounts to a relational database of Arch's models, which allows you to use just straight out of the box SQL tools to um, update to update tables. So you can insert data into a table, and in doing so, Arches behind the scenes will automatically sync your changes and this in this relational schema to the transactional data in Arches core graph-based schema. This is a this is a, a a case of with great power comes great responsibility kinds of things. Uh, it's possible to a lot of really, really sophisticated data manipulation here. And you should do that if you know what you're doing. Uh, this is a case also where a wrong turn puts the onus on you to fix it. Now, I will say that one of the things we've implemented here is, uh, is managing the transactions with specific unique identifiers. So any transaction that you implement in Arches, whether it's versus the user interface or here at the database level, has a transaction ID associated with it. So you can always use that to roll back things that you think you might have done in error. But really, the point I want to make here is for those of you who are uh, technically inclined and really feel like you've got uh, confidence in your SQL chops, you have um, you've got a brand new and really sophisticated and very high performance tool for working with Arch's data. And again, a good place to stop and see if there are questions. A comment from Ash that this ETL manager looks great. The pluggable importers with a common UI is a very well engineered solution to a hard programming problem. Really impressed. Thank you, Ash. Uh, you can thank Cyrus. He he did all the lead development there. Thanks, Ash. Um, last thing I want to say about data import and export is that we've spent some time really thinking through enhancing the way in which Arches integrates with Esri, uh, the Esri GIS ecosystem, both at the Esri server level, but interestingly, and maybe most importantly, at the at the Esri desktop level. So Arches now supports uh, pretty high performance real-time or essentially near real-time integration with ArcGIS Pro. And what does that mean in plain English? It means that you can configure Arches to, to present its quite sophisticated instance data as if they were uh, feature layers in ArcGIS Pro, and that you can use ArcGIS Pro to create new instances of models or update existing instances of models directly inside the Esri, inside the Esri application. And um, it requires the use of a add-in that we've written for Esri, freely available. But there's a, all you have to do is download it, double click on it, and it'll install itself in your ArcGIS Pro. And then configure Arches to default, you can configure Arches to decide how you want to present your instance data to your GIS users. And off you go. You can start, you can start using the full power of both Arches and Esri in one in in, in one environment. Um, I'm working on putting together a little video that demonstrates this. 
but the key point here is we've got it working. And I want to give a shout out to Historic England who've done some really good work in supporting this. So thanks to um, Andy Jones and his crew at Historic England for helping out with this. I guess the last thing I want to say here before seeing if there are any questions is to point out that the way we're doing this, and maybe it's, I'll step back a second and say it's interesting that one of the first things we've integrated with is a proprietary GIS system. So Esri is, as you know, proprietary. And we, Arches is open source. That doesn't preclude the ability to provide an integration between these two technologies. And we've done so in a way where we've leveraged standard, open standards-based ways of presenting the data. So the good news here is both Arches and Esri can speak the same open standards um, format of geodata. And we've used that to really foster this connection between Arches and, and Esri. So um, I know an, a, an image here or a little video would actually be worth all the words I've just spoken. I And I, I will be working on that, but hopefully some of that made sense and I'll see if there are questions. Uh, Dennis, there are two questions from Junaid. Um, the first, I'll put the first one, which relates to the Esri integration, which is, is QGIS also under consideration for integration? QGIS is definitely under consideration for integration. And honestly, probably be a lot easier to integrate with than Esri was. Um, yeah. So it's definitely, it's definitely something that we think is a really good idea. And I, Think would be great. Um, we don't have any funding to do that yet, but if there's interest out there amongst the community to take this on, I, I for one, think it's a great idea. And Junaid had a, another question relating back to data import, which is, can data be divided in insert and append operations between new, new CSV importer and relational schema? Um, well, I'll take the first one at that. There's nothing that would keep you from using both the ETL module and the relational schema in ways that make sense to you, uh, even if that means um, divvying up how you choose to modify your data. Um, Cyrus, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I can, yeah, I can imagine, you know, you might want to do uh, the lion's share of your load uh, using the relational schema where, you know, you'll, you'll really be able to leverage the performance and then, um, you know, maybe users can then, yeah, append data, um, additional tiles to resource instances. That seems yeah like a, a viable pattern for sure. Other questions, David? Uh, not at this point, no. Okay. Let's move on. Um, we've also spent a lot of time thinking about just overall performance improvements, not just performance improvements with data import and export, but also performance improvements at the kind of at the full application level. And there are kind of two things that I wanted to highlight in today's conversation. One is this idea of a published model. And what, what does that mean? Well, Right now in Arches, when you, anytime you ask Arches to show you information about a model, so when, you, when you're working with the editor or when you're doing um, certain search results or when you're asking for a report, um, Arches ends up having to build the structure of the model dynamically every time you request it. And we does that because one of the key strengths of Arches is it lets you build these models dynamically and interactively, and you can change them over time. But there's a cost for that. And the cost is to having to rebuild this, the current shape of the model every time you need to know about it. So what we've done in version seven is introduce this ability to essentially what we call publish the model. And that means when you've got the model in a shape that you like, and you're unlikely to change it any longer, you can publish it. And the publishing means essentially saving a serialized version of the model so that instead of Arches having to rebuild it dynamically every time, it can just, just go straight to the saved, essentially, 
version of your database of your model and use that to enter as a way of building data entry forms and um, and um, responding to search requests and report requests and that sort of thing. And um, there's a lot of technical detail here, which if there are questions, I'm happy to dive into. I think for this audience, the thing to really note is that models, publishing models is a performance enhancement. And as a really nice byproduct, we end up keeping a copy of how your models have changed through time. So if you make a model change, um, we'll un we keep track of every version of that model uh, in, in, in its evolution. So it's it would be possible to reuse earlier versions of models if you wanted to. And then the second idea here is what I've just called Webpack, and, because that's what it's called. Webpack is a way of essentially minifying, so building the web interface and and making the amount of information that needs to get sent from the Arches server to your computer smaller. So that should increase the performance. It should make Arches seem faster. And that's part of version seven. It has, in addition to some very immediate performance enhancements, it also provides some additional things that we think are pretty interesting. One of which is, the ability to support the use of alternate front end libraries for creation of Arches user interfaces in the future. And this is a big deal because some developers really, really like particular UI libraries. And we've done some early testing with Angular, I believe, is it Cyrus? React, actually. Or, sorry, React, where we can write, we can now write. Um, or rewrite existing Arches UI or create new UI using React, for example. But essentially that would be true for any front end library that you like. And I'll, I guess I'll stop there and see Cyrus if you wanted to add anything to either of those, either the published model or Webpack stuff. Oh, I think that was a really good summary. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll improve performance in two ways. We'll reduce um, uh, the demand on the database or the number of queries with the published model and and be able to compress um, files to deliver the front end much faster. So yeah, sounded real good. Thanks. Uh, any questions about this, David? No new questions. Excellent. Um, we've done a lot of work to ensure that Arches maintains consistency with some of its key underlying technologies. And Get a sense here of what some of them are, but things I wanted to highlight in particular are we've up, we've upgraded Arches version seven uh, to use the latest long term release of Django, and that brings with it some performance enhancements and some pretty significant uh, bug fixes as well. Uh, so the next version of Arches will take advantage of the improvements in Django, as well as Postgres. We're we're running Arches version seven on top of Postgres v14, which is the latest production version of Postgres. It remains awesome. And we also can take advantage of Postgres version three, which is a, uh, a, a kind of key extension to Postgres and provides a lot of the geospatial functionality. Uh, also remains awesome and fast. So we get to use the latest versions of both of those tech key technologies. We're also updating Arch's search engine to Elastic version 8. It provides a host of additional new capabilities. Uh, and one thing that immediately caught our eye is Elastic claims a performance improvement of 20% on indexing data. So that should also be something noticeable for our Arches community. Uh, we are in within Farallon, we've switched over to doing our Arches development and deployment using Docker. And that's turning out to be really, really nice, very efficient and effective way of standing up Arches and managing its dependencies. Uh, and is the kind of thing that would be really 
uh, I guess we would say a really, really good thing to look at if you were thinking about production deployment. And then finally, we use a number of libraries in Arches for all sorts of helper functions. And many of those libraries have gone through uh, their own improvements and evolution. So we've updated some of the key libraries that Arches uses uh, in many cases in its user interface. So we've done technology updates kind of throughout the application. And uh, I think we're pretty happy with where things stand there. Uh, Cyrus, anything to add? Uh, no, uh, yeah, other than, um... Let's see if you're, you know, doing development or you're 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 working with six and you're considering moving to uh, seven and you need to uh, run two versions of of um, Elastic at the same time for your different uh, implementations. Then yeah, Docker has been really helpful in, in allowing us to develop against both six and seven simultaneously. So, yeah. We have a new question from Carl. Um, who says Elasticsearch's recent releases are technically great, but are under a not quite open source license anymore, are altern alt alternate search libraries on the roadmap? Yeah, we're we are aware of that, and we have been talking about alternate search libraries, and there are, and they they do exist. There's lots of reasons why moving to them is either problematic or a, a lot of work. Um, I will say one thing we've been looking at as um, open search. And we made a conscious decision to not to not replace Elastic with open search, mostly because it would require um, that you run arches on AWS, which we don't want to do. So Cyrus, do you have anything to add there? Um. No, other than we're just keeping an eye on the situation, and you know maybe if if open search becomes more popular and is more available for um, you know uh, there there aren't the limitations that exist now, then then you know we'll um, we'll just keep our eyes on that, and and we would like to um, you know to support open source um, uh, or, or or ensure that our our dependencies are all open source possible. So um, yeah. Thanks for the question. Any other questions, David? No. All right. Um, which brings me really kind of to the end of this very, very quick tour. And that is to say that we're working on Arches version seven right now. And it is actually publicly available. It's on the Arches repo. Um, there's a version seven branch, which means that you can test it. Uh, you are you're you're able to pull the code and start looking at it and deciding what you think of it. So you can test arches now. And by the way, you should test arches now because it's a major upgrade, and there's a lot of there are a lot of new things there. And my pitch to you is the sooner your technical folks put some eyes on the new version of arches, um, the sooner you'll start to get a sense of what's possible and also the better it is for the community. So the more, the more people working on testing and, and identifying bugs and working with the code base, the better it is for everyone. So if you do have, if you have the flexibility of taking a look at Arches version seven and you've got some technical, you've got some some technical folks that would like to dive in. Uh, consider this an invitation. We would love it for the community to start putting Arches version seven through its paces. Uh, we're under no illusions that it's perfect yet because it isn't, and all the more reason for more people to look at it and identify places where it needs attention. But it is it is available. It does work. And it would be lovely to have feedback from the broader community. And I think I'm going to end with just reminding you that we have a release date set. It's August 31st of this year. So really, at the end of the month, that's coming up pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> we're busily at work at Farallon on finalizing uh, the first release of version 7. Uh, if you've got some time and you want to help, please, please do so. 
Um, but this is a good place to stop and see if there are any last questions. We do have one new question from Ash. Technical question, the process of upgrading from six to seven, how much work will it involve? Presumably it's not a straightforward Git pull, restart Apache like most minor upgrades are. Thank you for that question, Ash. This really was the question that I was expecting someone to ask and is a major reason why Cyrus is here. Yeah, this is going to be a bit more work than a, um, a, a typical upgrade um, for say a feature release. Uh, there are some changes that will be required to um, to all of your custom templates. Not huge changes, but um, but some modifications. Uh, we'll also, of course, have to update um, your uh, your dependencies like Elasticsearch, uh, and and then there are some some other you know um, changes that you'll have to make um, potentially. Uh, on your Apache server, but um, but it's well documented already. You know we'll we'll come up. You know present the the steps to to um, upgrade as we have before. Um, you know it, it it won't be it won't be as as bad as or as difficult I should say as upgrading from say three to four because there aren't any um, you know uh, major changes to the data model or anything like that. So um, so certainly. Uh, a little bit more work than a typical feature release, but um, but certainly doable. Can I just add one or two additional thoughts? One is the because internationalization requires us to manage string data in multiple languages. One thing to note is as you as you start thinking about importing strings into Arches in version seven. Um, at least early on, you'll have to think about how you've configured your Arches instance, what languages you've configured, and um, there is, you know, there's some onus on you to be, to make sure that you're consistent with the data that you import and the languages that you've configured for Arches to support. So there, there are, it's not really an upgrade. It's the result of after upgrading to Arches, you'll want to think a little bit more carefully about how you're how you're representing um, how you're representing your strings and data versus the UI. So there there will be some additional things to worry about from a you know from a um, a systems administration standpoint too. There is a new question from Jim McGowan. Um, this may not be the right venue for this question, but are there any updates on the status of a future collector app? Um, Good question, Jim, and thanks for posing it. The there, there's not. Well, I can. Here's what I can tell you. Uh, version this upgrade to version seven, and the inclusion of internationalization, has for sure has broken Arches Collector, and so it won't work in version seven, uh, for a number of reasons. So, we, and we know that. We're in the midst of thinking about how to how to support a next version of Arches Collector, and we are we're doing the initial engineering research right now on that. We've got some, I think, what actually amount to some pretty interesting ideas about how to re essentially rewrite Arches Collector for version seven, and that gives us an opportunity to re, to recalibrate the not only the approach but the technologies we're using. So I am thinking about that now. And I know that the Getty has asked us to start putting together some thoughts on overall effort and both time and costs for that. So it's definitely on the radar. Um, nothing has been approved or authorized yet, but we are absolutely thinking about that. So apologies if that only partially answers your question. But that is is really kind of where this that's where the the state of collector stands right now. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I'll just say thanks everyone for for attending today. Hopefully, you found this useful. Uh, I know it was a 
pretty quick sprint through all the new stuff that's coming and kind of purposely at a high level. If any of the things you heard about today are of deeper interest to you, let us know and we can talk about um, deciding whether it makes sense to have another group call or if there's uh, if there's interest in exploring how to use how to test arches um, and you need a little guidance, let us know. We're happy to get you pointed in the right direction. But um, really, my bottom line is I really appreciate you hanging out with us today and hearing about what we're doing. Um, thank you so much for that. And I guess I'll stop sharing my screen here and ask one more time if there are questions that anyone has, you know, would let, love to ask before we before we sign off. No? Well, um, again, thanks everyone. Really appreciate it. And um, best of luck with your arches work.